in the last video, we learned how uh, to plot points and polar coordinates instead of Cartesian coordinates. Um, and we also learned formulas for these polar coordinates and how to go back and forth interchangeably between Cartesian and polar coordinates. This time, what we're going to do in this video is we're going to now look at functions or curves in uh, polar coordinates. And so let's recall our, some knowledge of um, functions in the Cartesian plane, right? When we think of a function, y equals f of x, we understand that this represents a curve or uh, a graph of the function in the xy plane, in the Cartesian plane. So we have an algebraic representation for our function y equals f of x. And then we know um, we have some geometric meaning of our function as well um, in two-dimensional space. And so now we want something similar. So we want something similar in the r theta plane here. And generally how we will represent when possible, how we will represent functions is uh, something similar to y equals f of x. But now we're going to look at functions r equals f of theta. So we're going to turn our attention to looking at functions in the r theta plane and start to get um, a good background and understanding of what certain functions are, what their uh, graphs are going to look like when you plot points and draw curves. Okay, so let's start by doing that here. Let's do an example. I'd like to go through an example um, of plotting quite a few points and going over it pretty slowly and pretty rigorously so we can understand the method. And then once you know the method, you can apply this method to all the like future examples that I'll, that I'll be showing. Um, but for the sake of saving time, I'll just go through this method um, once with a, a relatively simple function so we can see what it's doing. And then we'll come up with some classifications and general formulas for other types of curves in the uh, r theta plane. So let's plot points here. To sketch the curve r equals 4 sine theta, right? So this is represented, this is of the form r equals a function of theta, right? 4 sine theta is absolutely a function of theta. But now let's get an idea of what these points uh, look like. And so if you remember how we plot points is first you plot the independent variable and then find the corresponding dependent variable's value. And theta is the independent variable here. So we'll pick theta points and then see what the value of r is at that corresponding theta value, right? So if we pick theta equals zero, well, we plug in zero to four sine theta, sine of zero is zero, right? So that means r is zero. And here's what I'm gonna do. As I plot points here, I'll draw a picture. So we know that we have the point zero, zero. Okay. Uh, what's our next point here? I'll try to save some room so I can get a handful of values in here. Let's plot theta equals pi over six. At theta equals pi over six, sine of pi over six is one half. 
right? So this is then four times sine, sorry, four times sine of pi over six and pi over sine of pi over six is one half. So this is four times one half, which is two. So that means we have the point two pi over six. So we come out two units at an angle of pi over six. So this is, so this was the point zero, zero. This is the point two pi over six. And so this line between them isn't necessarily um, the curve between the two points. I'm just using it to indicate that we're indeed at an angle of pi over six. Okay, so let's look at the next point here. The next natural point maybe would be to just kind of trace out uh, theta values on the unit circle. So like zero, pi over six, pi over four, pi over three, pi over two, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so let's look at pi over four. That would be the next theta value. If we look at pi over four, then we have four times sine of pi over four. Sine of pi over four is uh, root two over two. So that means r is then root two times two, right? Because you have four times root two over two, which just leaves you with two times root two. So that means here, now we're up to an angle of pi over four. And we have the point two root two, sorry, two root two comma pi over four. So we also have this point out here. This line should be a little longer, right? Next, let's look at like pi over three to plot a point. Then we'd have four times sine of pi over three. Sine of pi over three is uh, root three over two, I believe. So four divided by two is two. So we'd just be left with two root three here. So that means at pi over three here, we have, let me erase this. green nonsense up here. So at pi over three, we're out to the point, maybe it's a little longer even, we're out to the point uh, two root three, pi over three. And how about pi over two? Well, if we keep going here, pi over two is going to give us, sine of pi over two is one, so this would just give us four, right? So, we're up to four here, and this is our point four comma pi over two. And you could do this for a handful of, of other points, right? You could keep filling in all these values. Maybe I'll hit some of the big ones here. So you would have like pi, right? If you plug in pi, well, sine of pi is zero. So that gets you zero. So that means by the time you are back to pi, you know, you would have more points, you keep doing the same thing, keep doing the same thing. And by the time you get back to pi, you hit zero, okay? And if you keep plotting points all the way to two pi, what you'll get Once you trace all of these points together is a circle. This is a circle of radius two centered at the point. The center of this circle is going to be uh, zero two. So this is a circle of radius two centered at zero two. And that's what this function r equals four sine theta is describing. 
which, and so now we can see about how plotting points here, you know, you'd fill in the rest, how plotting points um, leads to us being able to determine what uh, these functions are, what they look like as a curve in polar coordinates. Okay, so now what I want to do now that we know how to be able to take a function and figure out what its curve looks like just by plotting points, right, being meticulous with picking a theta value, plugging it in, plotting it, et cetera, et cetera, right? So next, I want to go through um, a, a pretty good number of examples. Okay. So for the first example, I want to just start with where theta is constant and there is no R involved whatsoever. Okay. So this is just theta is some constant number, right? And if we think about this, theta equals pi over three, and this means we have no restriction on R, right? So R can vary. It can be any, it can be as big as possible or uh, as infinitesimal as possible, right? So what that means is the graph, the corresponding curve for theta equals pi over three is a line because of the radius is unrestricted, but the, the angle is restricted. It has to specifically be at theta equals pi over three. How can we see this without just kind of like forceful intuition and kind of figuring this out just based on like a thought experiment? We have equations that explicitly tell us um, conversions. We know that theta is arctan of y over x, or moreover, tangent of theta is equal to y over x. But if theta is pi over 3, then tangent pi over 3 is equal to y over x. Well, if you uh, look up on the unit circle what tangent of pi over 3 is, you'll see that it's root 3. So that tells us that y equals root 3x, which is exactly a line through the origin of slope tangent of theta, right? This line right here is y equals tangent of pi over 3 times x, which makes sense. So we can use our equations from transferring between our conversion formulas here, we can use these to figure to also figure out without plotting points explicitly what functions in polar coordinates are doing. Okay, and so this generalizes. If we have the function theta equals k, for k just some constant, right, then in Cartesian coordinates, this is the line y equals tangent of k times x, which the graph is a line through the origin slope tangent of k. And so that's true for any graph or any function of this form. So we have a nice generalization here. Let's look at another uh, nice generalization here. Let's look at two. So I don't know if I numbered these. Whoops. Yes, I did. So that was the first example. Let's look at the second, second example here. Let's look at the function now where the radius is a constant and there's no theta involved whatsoever. If the radius is constant, Let's use our conversion formulas like we did uh, previously here. And then we can start to think about the intuition behind why this is true, right? So we have r equals three, but we know that r squared is equal to x squared plus y squared. 
plugging in r equals three, we get x squared plus y squared equals three squared. Well, in Cartesian coordinates, we know that this is a circle of radius three. Okay, so if you see something like r equals a constant, then it's just a circle of that radius, right? And that makes sense because here we have a restriction on r, but no restriction on theta. So we're allowed to be at every possible angle in this graph, but we have to remain a fixed distance away from the origin. And in this case, it's a fixed distance of three units, which gives us a circle of radius three. So we can make another generalization here that if we have r equals r zero, this corresponds to the Cartesian equation, x squared plus y squared equals r naught squared. The graph is a circle of radius r zero centered at the origin. Okay. And now there's one other type of um, curve I want to look at that generalizes nicely as well. Let's look at the curve um, given by the function r equals 6 cosine theta minus 8 sine theta. And let's see what this gives us here. Okay. So when trying to convert this one, we need to be a little clever here. Because remember our conversion formulas, right? You can pull up all four of them if you want. We have one set that's x squared plus y squared equals r squared, um, along with tangent theta equals y over x. And then we also have x equals r cosine theta, y equals r sine theta. <laughs> When I look at this, I see a cosine theta and I see a sine theta. So it tells me I probably want to use these down here. But I don't quite have x and y, right? I'm short one multiplication by r here. So I can be clever and multiply both sides of this equation by r. And if I do that, I get r squared equals 6r cosine theta minus 8r sine theta. Right, I've just multiplied both uh, sides of this equation by r. And now I see an r squared, which I know is x squared plus y squared. I see an r cosine theta, which I know is x. And I see an r sine theta, which I know is y. So I can use all three of these simultaneously to completely convert this to Cartesian coordinates and get x squared plus y squared on the left equals 6x minus 8y. Right, and maybe I'll indicate where these guys went. Here, simply using, um, like recalling my conversion equations over here on the right. And so now we can simplify this equation in Cartesian coordinates and understand what's, uh, what this curve is going to look like. So let's add both sides, um, or let's add both the 6x and negative 8y over to the other side of the equation. So if we do that, we'll get x squared plus y squared equals, so okay, so what do I have? Sorry, 6x minus 8y, 6x minus 8y, that becomes x squared minus 6x, plus y squared plus 8y equals 0. And now this may seem like I'm popping it out of thin air, but it's a pretty common trick. Once you get to somewhere like this, you see both in x and the y variable, we look like something that's very close to being able to be factored. And indeed, we can factor both of these separately if we complete the square. So we're going to complete the square twice. Complete the square twice, two times. 
Okay, if we complete the square in x, we get x squared minus 6x. Uh, completing the square, we would have to add, let's see, we would have to add 9, right? And then minus 9. And then plus, let's complete the square in y. y squared plus 8y. Then we have plus 16 minus 16 equals 0. And then we can add the negative 9 and negative 16 to the other side to get x squared minus 6 x plus 9, and then plus y squared plus 8y plus 16 equals 25. Okay, and now, like why we did completing the square, these are things that can be factored quite nicely. This turns into x, let's see, this is going to be x minus 3 squared plus y plus 4 squared equals 25. So now this is something that looks a lot nicer and something that we can handle. And so if you see something like this here, you'll want to think complete the square. And if you need to refresh yourself on how to complete the square, that's totally fine. Um, I had to before, before giving this. So, um, so let's see what we have here. We have x minus 3 squared plus y plus 4 squared equals, I'll write it, 25 as 5 squared. What is this? If you recall, this is a circle of radius 5 centered at the point 3, negative 4. So graphically, you come down like 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4. So you have a circle way down here. So this is a bad picture, right? Because it's a circle of radius 5. So 1, 2. It's going to be something like this, and it would be off the screen, right? But you can see that that would indeed make a circle of radius 5. And this is the point 3, negative 4. And remember, that is what the equation, the equation for this curve here was r equals 6 cosine theta minus 8 sine theta. This was our curve that we started with. And so this also represents a circle. But now it's not a circle that's just necessarily centered um, at the origin. It can be centered anywhere. Okay, and that's kind of a generalization here. Um, we can make a generalization, um, which I'll yes, sorry. So here's like a generalization for circles. Circles are of the form r equals a cosine theta plus b sine theta, okay? And again, last time, b was negative 8. So you can have something that looks like a cosine theta minus sine theta or something like this. So this is a generalization, generalization for circles, right? And we saw um, another example like when in the first example, you know, like A or B can be zero. We had R equals four sine theta, and we saw that that was also a circle. So, okay. Next, I want to kind of just list a few curves here. And a few curves, how about a few polar curves? So I'm gonna list a few polar curves and then um, just some cool examples. And then I briefly wanna talk about the symmetry of polar curves that can make our life easier for 
uh, plotting points or for figuring out how curves work. So the first one I want to mention is a spiral. Spirals are of the form R equals A plus B theta. So for example, if we look at the equation, so here's an example. If we look at the equation R equals theta over three, we get the following curve. We get something that starts at the origin. Maybe I'll draw it in red. And it spirals out like this. So this curve is represented by r equals theta over 3. Um, OK. The next kind of example I'd like to talk about is a cardioid. So a cardioid can take many forms. There are four different forms it can take. It's, it can be r is a times 1 plus or minus cosine theta. So those are two of the forms. And the other two forms are a one plus or minus sine theta. And so let's take an example of how these look. Or let's see an example of what these look like. So if we consider the example three of one plus cosine theta, here's um, what the graph would look like. And again, you can figure this these out by plotting points, converting to um, rectangular, seeing how they behave, etc. cetera. Um, so an example of a cardioid is something that looks like this. It kind of looks like a heart, kind of a round heart shape. That's what cardioids look like when you graph them. And this should be symmetric. This should be purely symmetric. Um, my drawing is terrible and not symmetric, but hopefully you get the idea. So that's a cardioid. And then there's a what's called a limason. Limason um, is a curve of the following form. You can have r equals a cosine theta plus b, or r equals a sine theta plus b. And so let's see an example of a limason. Here, let's take um, r equals 2 plus 4 sine theta. Okay, The graph of this will look something like this here we start at the origin and it's like a cardioid but you have a loop in the middle okay so this is an example of a limason so here it's like li ma son if you'd like the pronunciation okay and there's one more i want to talk about and that is a rose A rose um, can have a very many or very few petals. Um, and we'll look at examples of all sorts of functions um, of this nature. So we have a cosine b theta, or r equals a sine b theta. And let's look at the example, r equals 3 sine 2 theta. OK, this example is a four petaled rose. That looks something like this. Again, this should be purely symmetric, um, meaning this should just be like a mirror image. Like each petal should be a mirror image of, of one adjacent to it. So for example, if you were to take this symmetry about the line theta, uh, theta equals pi over two, then it would be symmetric. But it would also be symmetric about like the r axis here. Um, and this one is really interesting because it would also be symmetric. Like a four petaled rose would also be symmetric about uh, the lines pi over four and three pi over four as well. Um, so there's. And as you can see, kind of in all of these, there's a lot of symmetry. We're symmetric this way, right? If you were to flip this over the line or kind of mirror over the line, theta equals pi over two, this sh should be symmetric. We would have symmetry over the line 
uh, theta equals zero, or the r-axis, if you'd like to think about it like that. Um, this one, um, a spiral doesn't have much symmetry just based on its nature, right? But so the idea, and like obviously circles have a lot of symmetry um, based on their center and everything like that. So that's the, the just some closing remarks I want to make here is the symmetry of polar curves. Okay, and that'll wrap it up for um, our introduction to polar coordinates and polar curves. And then after this, we will start to look about how we can find formulas for area and arc length um, using functions and polar coordinates. Um, so here's the first type of symmetry that I would like to discuss here. So here's one type of symmetry. We say the function f equals r of theta is symmetric about the polar axis if f of theta equals f of negative theta. Okay, so here's an example of something that's symmetric about the polar axis, meaning this axis right here. If we were to take, here's a cardioid, something like this, and you can look at the point r theta, right? When you look at the corresponding negative theta value, these radii should be the same. So this is the point r negative theta. But notice that r is the same. And as you vary your theta, right, it's the same, the function, the value of the function is the same, whether theta is positive or whether theta is negative, right? Either way, we're getting r. So this is an example of when a curve is symmetric about the polar axis, okay? The second type of symmetry I'd like to talk about is we say r equals f of theta is symmetric about the pole if r equals f of theta is unchanged if r is replaced with negative r. So what does it mean to be symmetric about the pole? Well, let's take a two-petaled rose. something like this. And this should be symmetric about the pole here. So maybe I can try to draw it a tad better. Okay. And we want to look at the point R theta here, right? So what it means to be symmetric about the pole is this is unchanged when we look at the same angle, but a different radius, the negative radius, right? So we get that basically what you see in quadrant one if you imagine symmetry about this pole it's kind of, if you were to flip it to the third quadrant here, you get the same thing. That's what it means to be symmetric about the pole. And so here's an example of, uh, so in this case, we have like a two petaled rose, right? Um, why is, before I go to the last type of symmetry that I wanna talk about, why is this so helpful? Well, it cuts down the number of points you have to plot to figure out what a curve is, right? If we can determine that this is symmetric about uh, a given axis, like the pole, or um, we're gonna see one that's symmetric about the line theta equals pi over two or something like that, well, then you only have to plot 
a number of points, and then you can just use its symmetry to figure out what the rest of the picture is going to look like. So for example, if we were trying to figure out uh, the graph of this two petaled rose, we would only have to plot points between theta equals zero and theta equals pi over two. If we know this is symmetric about the pole, we can just kind of copy paste our picture upside down and flipped to get the rest of the image, right? So for example, when we were symmetric about um, the polar axis, we only have to take values, we only have to check values between theta equals zero and theta equals pi, because we know we can just flip our picture here, right? We know what the corresponding radius will be um, at the symmetric at the negative angle, right? And so you only have to plot half the number of points that you would to get um, the full picture here. And so let's look at the last type that I'd like to talk about and then wrap up the video. So here I would like to talk about um, functions. We say R is symmetric about the line theta equals pi over two if f of theta is the same as f of pi minus theta. So let's see an example here. Let's look at another cardioid, right? If you look at, say, a cardioid, it looks something like this. If we take the point, um, say, over here, if we take some point r theta and look at this radius here, we note that this radius will be the same if we take the angle r of pi minus theta. If we take the angle r of pi minus theta, we get the same radius. And basically what we have is we just have um, a graph that is symmetric about this line theta equals pi over two, which is kind of synonymous with the y-axis here in this case, right? You just kind of imagine folding the first or one side of this cardioid over the y-axis and you get a mirror image. So that wraps up um, our discussion about polar curves um, and some basic examples. In the next video, we'll talk about deriving arc length and area formulas in polar coordinates. So I'll talk to you guys then.